Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second um, iteration of ATSV, Apparel Textile Sourcing Virtual, Canadian edition. We're back here for our second time in 2021. Um, we're going to go ahead and get our sessions, our seminar series um, kicked off here. And we always like to start the show with a good overview of what's going on in the world of trade, specific to the apparel industry, trade policy sourcing. We have um, some of our past uh, speakers who are going to be speaking a little bit about what's going on globally. The world is changing very quickly, as you all well know, and they're going to speak a little bit about current events and how that's affecting um, the North American, especially, but also the global trade markets. So I'd like to introduce our, um, our panelists. First, we have Julia K. Hughes, the president of the United States Fashion Industry Association, Association excuse me, USFIA. Uh, Rich Harper, the Director of Government Affairs over at the Outdoor Industry Association, or OIA, and Dr. Sheng Lu. He is the Associate Professor, Professor of the Department of Fashion Apparel Studies at the University of Delaware. So we're going to go ahead and get the panel kicked off. I would like to let everyone watching know, even on Facebook Live, that if you have any questions along the panel at any point, please go ahead and um, insert them in the chat function and we'll go ahead and address them as soon as, um, as soon as they come in. If not, you can also hold your questions until the end of the panel and we'll go ahead and do a quick Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Julia Hughes here and uh, we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks a lot and we're so glad to be here today. So I'm screen sharing, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, in case you in case you don't recognize all of us, we thought we'd start with our the first uh, slide with our titles and our lovely photos. Um, so hi, welcome. Great to be here. So I'm going to kind of kick us off here a little bit. And this is going to be a, a relatively informal uh, conversation looking at what are some of the key issues and the top business challenges. Um, and I, in, in many ways, it's, it's kind of obvious, right? Looking at COVID-19 and the impact on the economy and on business, um, managing supply chain risks, and there's a lot of different risks. We're gonna talk about some of those today. Uh, the increasing costs and delays with supply chain and the logistics, and obviously increasing production and sourcing costs. And from here on in, we're going to have a, a real conversation. Um, about what's happening on the trade issue. So Rich and I are going to kick this kick this apart off, but Shang's going to throw in uh, some of his comments and uh, his viewpoints as well. So right, th this is the one slide, like this is my thought, which is like, trade wars aren't over yet, but I think we all agree. Like, I, I don't know about all of you in the audience, um, but if you had asked me, I would have thought that by the time we were in mid-September, we would not be in the same position with penalty tariffs, 301 tariffs, and trade wars still going on from the past administration. Um, yet, yet here we are, we're still talking about a lot of the same issues and we're not necessarily seeing answers yet. Um, how do you feel, Rich? Exactly. I mean, I think what, you know, we had shared with members, um, outdoor companies at the beginning of the year is that they had to keep in mind that, you know, this administration had made it clear you know, that they were going to focus on domestic priorities, uh, providing COVID relief. And of course, much of the debate now in Washington is around the infrastructure proposal and additional spending priorities. Um, you know, that being said, I think our hope had been that there would be at least some movement towards, you know, movement on some uh, trade priorities, that there would be, you know, some feedback from the administration on its top to bottom review of the China 301 tariffs, um, you know, for example. Um, so I think we very much have a partner um, you know, with this administration and a more pragmatic approach uh, to international trade. But here we are um, now September and still, you know, dealing with these issues and, and this uncertainty. And so what I've been telling members is they have to, you know, be mindful of the fact that this could still drag on a, a bit and that's going to have an influence on, on their sourcing decisions and moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. And so we're going to we're going to go through a couple of those issues and do maybe a, a slightly deeper dive on, on some of the key the key issues. So, I mean, like, here's the, the obvious right China, um, you know, that is the top issue, as Rich said, 
you know, there's been a whole of government review of China policy that's ongoing since the Biden administration took office. Um, but they haven't come out yet with what are going to be the recommendations um, so that we're we're not just, you know, still paying the 301 tariffs, which, you know, which looking at the key issues for our sector, that's a really big one because um, we already have some of the highest tariffs that anyone pays on imports. Um, but also the fact that there's been no action necessarily to reinstate product exclusions. So products that the past administration even said weren't available you know, in the US or globally, and so therefore shouldn't be subject to, to the tariffs. And, and you know, the biggest concern that I had were the press reports that started coming out last week that the Biden administration is looking at using the tool of 301 themselves to have an even broader, bigger 301 on China. Um, now that, I, I, I don't think that's been decided yet, um, but the fact that that's under discussion, and I am sure that Rich agrees with me and Sheng agrees, it's like, oh my God, that that is like a gut, a punch in the stomach of, what's going to happen on trade and how can companies really be planning our business and, and understanding um, you know, where do we go on trade policy, particularly to try to stop that? Because we've been focused on let's lift the old tariffs. Let's, and if not, at least get product exclusions back in place. But now we, we have kind of another front that we need to fight on. I think one thing, you know, we did see some movement earlier in the year when the Senate passed legislation, um, you know, to reinstate an exclusion process, reinstate some of the exclusions that had expired um, at the end of uh, 2020. Um, but that being said, um, there still hasn't been any movement in the House. Um, and we'll get into some of the other trade matters that might, you know, create a, a trade policy, a trade package by the end of the year. Um, you know, we had anticipated that the administration would do that top to bottom review. Um, we had anticipated that they would pursue a more multilateral approach uh, to China, addressing some of the concerns that led to the 301 tariffs. Um, but one thing I think also it's important for um, companies to keep in mind is that while I think a lot in Congress had concerns about the approach that the previous administration took you know, towards China and the 301 tariffs, um, these tariffs do remain popular um, you know, with a, a bipartisan group of representatives and senators. Um, and so I think, you know, we've been able to, to, I think, demonstrate the impact that these tariffs are having um, on outdoor companies and having on the ability of outdoor companies to innovate and develop new products, create jobs. Um, but there hasn't been that kind of push from Congress uh, to the Biden administration, you know, to, to revisit this issue. And so I think companies have to keep that in mind. I do anticipate that, you know, we will get a new exclusion process. We will have the opportunity to make the case that certain products, you know, should be excluded um, from the tariffs. But you have to keep in mind that the administration will still need something um, from China in return for lifting all uh, tariffs. I'd hope we'd make, you know, more progress, um, you know, by this time. And then to hear the possibility of a new round of tariffs is certainly concerning, to put it very mildly. I mean, our <laughs> outdoor companies have been dealing with a whiplash of, um, you know, tariffs from the previous four years. And the uncertainty of what comes next added to that the impact of the COVID COVID-19 on our supply chains. Um, added to that, you know, the talk earlier in this year about maybe Vietnam being a target for a 301 uh, investigation. So what I've been continuing to tell members is that as you're making sourcing decisions, you have to keep uh, that in the back of your mind. And we continue to push and press for um, lifting all uh, punitive tariffs on products, uh, outdoor products coming out of China um, but here we are, and, and again, this administration is, is right now focused on infrastructure, focused on a uh, second spending uh, package uh, topping perhaps $3.5 trillion, and that has sucked up a lot of the oxygen in the room. Yeah. Um, so we have our work cut out for ourselves, but I think we, we want to make it plain to the administration and to our representatives and senators that punitive tariffs, again, are, are taxes on American companies that impact our ability to develop new products, create new jobs, bring product to market, and particularly for outdoor companies during the era of COVID, where we've seen more people get outdoors, that impacts the ability to get products to those you know, new outdoor uh, consumers. So it's, that uncertainty is, continues to be problematic uh, for our members. I mean, and taxes on consumers too. And I, I, feel, I feel as though 
you know, there's been a lot of conversation about workers and families with the administration, and I think they get that. But, you know, this is a clear opportunity where, you know, inflationary pressures could could be eliminated if we could eliminate these tariffs. I think Shane, one, do you have a comment too? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just want to add a quick point. Um, you no, know, I'm an economist, so I'm mostly, you know, pointing the numbers and seeing, you know, how the changing, I mean, how, how you no know, sourcing is changing. And I have to admit that China really gave me a very hard time you know, how to look at China you know, as a apparel sourcing base for US fashion brands and retailers. Somehow I see you know, conflicting kind of information. So if you just look at those business factors, those economic factors, I think it still makes sense. It still makes sense for companies to source from China. Why? And if you look at the, you know, not, I mean, not only just the volume, but you know, also look at the variety of products China can make. You no, know, number one, really, you know, it's you no know, Vietnam, you know, is catching up, but still, you know, it is only 10, you no, know, one tenth of those products China can make. And also, you know, you know, these days when we are talking about new lockdown measures, Vietnam was you know, was 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 under a new lockdown, um, Bangladesh, you know, those Southeast Asian countries. So there's really not too many places companies can go. So I mean, this is why I think you look, if, if you look at the most recent data, China's market share actually is quite solid, quite solid. However, however, no, no, this is my comments, no, always, no, do not uh, underestimate the impact of non-economic factors. And if you look, I mean, especially if you look at China's market share for cotton apparel products, you no, know, cut by more than half in just two years. And this is not, I mean, this is not usual. And this is really reminds us you know, those tariff war, those uncertainties really will affect companies, you know, sourcing spend from the country. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it, you know, the China issue also is another way that highlights the dysfunction with the U.S. Congress right now. So, because pretty much if you ask any senator or any member in the House, they would say that taking action to support the U.S., workers and companies versus their competitors in China, everyone agrees with that. And yet, as Rich said, you know, the Senate has passed legislation, the, the House still do, doesn't seem to have their path forward on China. Like we haven't seen action on China that I also think we would have predicted earlier this year that the Congress would have come out with you know, several different China bills probably, or some very major legislation that focuses on China, but we haven't, we haven't seen that either, which is kind of just another reflection of how hard it is to get things done right now here in DC. I would just add, I mean, two quick points on consumer prices. You know, I think our members really bent over backwards at the beginning of the 301 tariffs to avoid passing, you know, those additional yeah. costs on to consumers. Um, but at some point, it just became inevitable. Um, and so particularly for outdoor products in, in, that have those significant high import tariffs and that are, I mean, performance footwear, performance uh, apparel, et cetera, um, those are it's, it's a significant cost and a significant added cost is another barrier to the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And to the professor's point, you know, a lot of our members in when the 301 tariffs began did look at alternative sourcing options. And many have, have permanently shifted outside of China to diver, try to diversify their sourcing options. I've also spoken to other companies that have shifted those supply chains and then gone back. You know, the infrastructure, the know-how, um, the ability to get the best product available for many members still uh, remains in China. And so you've seen that sort of movement um, back to China uh, in some cases. But what I've just advised members is you have to, if you, as you're making those sourcing decisions, you have to be mindful of where we are with China, the mood in Congress um, and the lack of a a final top to bottom review of the China Freedom Tariffs from this administration. So as you're making those decisions, you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah. So let's move on to, to kind of our next topic. And we already touched on this, right? Vietnam. I mean, I think so, because while China dominates the textile and apparel and accessory imports and footwear imports, you know, Vietnam is is the go to next largest and, and key supplier for, for almost all brands and retailers. Um, and, you know, Vietnam is a trade issue as well. I mean, the good news was earlier this year, the administration were not moving forward on a currency 301 um, that had folks very concerned about having additional tariffs potentially on, on many of our products. But they are still moving forward on a 301, you know, for illegal logging and wood products. 
that raises some concerns as well for what's going to be our the trading relationship uh, with Vietnam going forward. And is, is that going to be a reliable destination? Um, and as Sheng said, also with, with the impact of COVID that we're really seeing that now in Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, just quickly to that point, Julie, you know, we were sending a letter to the president um, outlining our concerns about the, the vaccination rates in Vietnam and the impact that they're having on uh, our supply chains uh, for our members. So it's very concerning. Vietnam is, you know, probably after China, the, the second uh, most popular sourcing option for a good amount of outdoor apparel uh, and footwear. Um, and so first with the 301 investigation and then the impact on COVID, um, it does have, again, just creates more uncertainty for members, you know, that are looking for that a stable, predictable, um, you know, sourcing option. And um, the other thing I think to keep in mind, you know, with Vietnam is that, um, you know, it was previously, um, you know, a country where we saw significant uh, movement out of China uh, to Vietnam, um, where our members struggle and some of our members struggle are the small, medium sized businesses. Um, Vietnam, for some products, is at capacity for a lot of yeah. apparel and a lot of footwear. And so your small, medium-sized business trying to perhaps avoid some of the China 301 tariffs, and you're looking at options in Vietnam, in some cases, you're at the back of the line uh, to more global brands. In other cases, mm -hmm. in order to do business, you have to order more um, than perhaps that you had initially anticipated. Um, so that kind of you know, uncertainty also you know, plays a role with a lot of our members. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, you know, we're also seeing, you know, leakage of some of the China issues into Vietnam. So, you know, we haven't really touched on the issue of the withhold release orders um, from CBP uh, against, you know, cotton products from China. But we have now heard from companies that shipments from Vietnam are being stopped as well, um, which I think is part of the, the CBP perspective that hey, if it's from Asia, um, we're going to take a closer look at it. So that's kind of a, a an additional layer of uncertainty that companies need to deal with. So let's keep going through our um, trade issues. Um, and kind of, we're, we're kind of doing this a little bit regionally, but it won't only be regional. And I think what Western Hemisphere, you know, is, is um, a more positive story and maybe a potentially even more positive than that, looking at the relationship with Mexico and Canada through USMCA, and then also looking at, at CAFTA. And I know we're going to talk more about this later from the sourcing perspective, but from the policy perspective in particular, um, I just want to say a few words about, about CAFTA, because that's one where a lot of the industry is looking today for how can we work with the administration since they are focused on Northern Triangle in particular and the immigration issue to enhance work jobs in the region, in the apparel and footwear and accessories sectors um, to create the jobs there and bring those to the US duty free using CAFTA. So I think there's a lot of opportunities right now. There are a lot of ideas that are under discussion, but I feel like going forward, that's going to be a trade issue that we're going to keep coming back to and looking at how can we make that more effective? I think, you know, one thing um, that we've noticed over the past several years as our members are looking at, you know, different sourcing options is looking for, um, you know, stability with free trade agreement partners. Um, you know, so we'll get into the general system of preferences. Uh, that's hasn't been renewed. Uh, the miscellaneous tariff bill process hasn't yet to be, you know, renewed. Um, I think our members are looking for that stable, predictable trade policy are taking to keep an eye open for our free trade agreement uh, partners. Um, and we're, we strongly supported uh, the renegotiation of NASA, the U USMCA agreement, um, because we want to preserve that reciprocal duty-free market access, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that had been in place for over 20 years. And we'd hope that that would be a springboard, I guess, for additional uh, trade agreements and additional ne negotiations, which hasn't yet um, materialized. Um, but as our members are continue to think about diversifying, you know, sourcing options, they are looking to uh, FTA partners. The key for, I think, outdoor products again is that high performance apparel, that high performance footwear. Do those countries have, you know, the infrastructure uh, and the technical expertise and the human expertise? Um, you know, to make those products. Um, and so that's at the forefront of those kind of conversations with 
um, our vendors uh, in, in FDA partner countries. Yeah. I mean, one thing that we also were trying, we have been doing uh, is offering webinars uh, for companies to kind of like, do a refresher course on what the benefits are. I feel like, you know, it's been around for USMCA is relatively new. Um, but not that different from the NAFTA that companies were used to and CAFTA has been around now for a while, but um, let's kind of do a deep dive on where are there some benefits for the simpler rules of origin, for example, that are cut and sew, or, you know, how to do, how to use short supply. Um, and we want to kind of also take, we're going to be taking a look at the accumulation provision, like, you know, none of those are like overnight game changers, but there are there definitely are provisions that could be used more um, to enhance the Western Hemisphere sourcing. And, and then, of course, that sourcing helps to deal with some of the shipping delays um, and the port congestion that we've been seeing on especially the West Coast, but even to some extent the East Coast. And I think it'd be, you know, it's it'd be nice to have those conversations with an administration where there's not the threat to walk away from the agreement altogether, which is something that was hanging over our heads with uh, the USMCA uh, negotiations uh, in the, with yeah. the previous administration. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I and but I do feel that um, maybe in part because the the China policy review is, is still ongoing, is, is that that kind of takes some of the attention away from the the Western Hemisphere side because overall the administration is, is still focused on how how do we deal with. Um, China more than how to we how do we you know expand the trade with our friends. That's right. Okay, then let's we'll go on to okay, so kind of all right, Congress needs to act. I I, I feel like we're all we're always saying that we're waiting for Congress. Um, you know, but there's a couple of things that are that are outstanding that are so essential and you know obviously one is gsc the generalized system of preferences that even though that's not available for apparel today or footwear today um, there still are a lot of products that brands and retailers rely on that are hard lines or that qualify for gsp or the travel goods that are in gsp so we really you know we're, we're looking for that to to be renewed and it seems like the the senate got that um when they looked at trade but it, everything is stopped in the house yeah. and then of course to pass the gsp footwear bill um and i think i'll rich rich will talk more about that that you know that makes a lot of sense and of course we we hope for we keep working to get apparel sometime uh, to move forward as well but maybe rich you want to talk about the gsp footwear bill yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, you know, we had worked on uh, the initiative that made travel goods eligible uh, for GSP for the first time. And so that passed as part of the trade legislation in 2015. And we saw a significant um, duty savings as a result of uh, passage of that legislation. Yeah. I think $300 million, even in 2020, impacted by COVID, um, companies saved $300 million on duties uh, because travel goods from GSP eligible countries uh, were duty free. And these are duty savings that go into new product development, go into new yeah. job hires uh, in the U.S. Um, and so it's a significant boost um, you know, for companies that are able to utilize uh, those provisions. And so the next step you know, that we thought you know, would be, make sense to focus on was footwear. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we developed, a, a OIA developed a very narrow targeted uh, approach on footwear, um, looking primarily at, at footwear, outdoor footwear products like hiking boots with a waterproof breathable liner, that have an import tariff as high as 37 and a half percent. And we've been able to go to our domestic manufacturers and identify you know, products you know, we believe aren't produced domestically, um, but would provide significant you know, duty savings uh, for outdoor companies if they were made a part uh, of the GSP program. And another key point we often share with administration is that you know, the duty savings for a lot of outdoor companies can also then help fuel uh, domestic production. We have a number of members um, like LL Bean, for example, that you know source some finished product from abroad can utilize the duty savings, um, you know, from uh, those from adding GSP footwear to GSP that will help you know their domestic line uh, manufacturing. So we're, we're continuing to work with our you know some of our champions in Congress to get this bill introduced and included as a part of package to renew GSP. I think most members understand that ultimately GSP will get renewed. I didn't anticipate that we'd be in September. 
um, still. Um, and we press that point with Congress. You know, these are you know companies that have to make sourcing decisions, that have to make pricing decisions. You know, for 22 and beyond. And while they see that a bill has been passed by the Senate to renew GSP, refund all duties paid, the uncertainty of when that's actually going to happen does have a huge impact um, on business and on members making um, sourcing decisions. So we'll continue to, to press the point, um, you know, to get this done by the end of the year. Our expectation is that this would have been done um, much sooner and, you know, candidly should have been done by the end of 2020. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, and there's one other argument, you know, that that we've made um, for for those members of Congress who are who who, un, who understand trade, right? Is that um, the addition of travel goods to GSP proved the argument that we long have made that if you give that duty benefit, you are going to expand sourcing. So so sourcing has shifted from China. Um, to other to developing countries that needed the jobs um, because of the duty free benefit has allowed that to happen. So it's been really helpful for Cambodia and for the Philippines and for you know a number of countries who are taking advantage of of GSP. Um, so from the broader policy perspective as well, I mean, there's really no argument against GSP. I feel like it, it's just a captive. I don't know how you feel about this, Rich, but I feel like it's a captive to you know, the broader dysfunction um, and disagreements and not that there's really people who are opposed to it. I think that's, I mean, you know, GSP traditionally passes overwhelmingly with an overwhelming bipartisan support, same with miscellaneous tariff bills. It's just got caught up, um, you know, with, again, so much of the auction sucked up by infrastructure, by COVID, by a, additional spending package. Um, and so we are where we are, uh, which is un unfortunate, um, but, I mean, to your point, Julie, I, mean, I think we've seen $5 billion shift in trade on travel goods out of China mm -hmm. to GSP uh, countries. And when I was asked, when I was testifying against the China 301 tariffs uh, with the previous administration, I, I was asked, where have you seen success you know, in companies you know, shifting supply chains out of China? I made that very point. When you provide mm -hmm. a duty-free benefit, um, you'll see uh, companies act. Um, and so uh, obviously one of our key arguments in adding some footwear to GSP uh, is, is to do exactly that. Well, and you mentioned MTB. So, I mean, I think miscellaneous tariff bill is another, you know, similar example of, of, you know, legislation that companies have relied on, you know, and so every time that it expires and we have to wait for renewal, that's kind of a disincentive, um, you know, it, the products are very limited. I mean, I would say more limited for apparel than than you know for footwear and some other um, parts of it. But this legislation and, and making sure that it, it it does cover finished products, yep. um, since that is a major concern. Um, I think that that's another priority. Without question, you know there there's so few opportunities for tariff relief, you know, for our companies. Um, Free trade agreements is one, but we, we've, we're kind of at a standstill there. Um, mm -hmm. Trade preference programs is another, and you see what's going on with GSP. Um, and these are limited, temporary, you know, tariff relief measures. And we, it's supposed to be for a three-year period. We've almost lost one of those three years, you know, at this point. Um, and to the finished product question, yet yeah, that their House Democrats introduced legislation that would prohibit um, using finished products for MTVs in future rounds. And our argument is that you know this is a thorough and rigorous vetting process. We filed 16 footwear MTBs, about eight were cleared by the International Trade Commission. Um, and so it's by no means easy. And on top of that, a member of Congress could still object to a cleared MTV as we saw with four bars in the House bill. Um, yes. So this is by no means easy and it is a, a temporary uh, measure. Um, and so we continue to press the point that you should preserve uh, MTBs uh, for finished goods um, and again, those duty savings for a lot of companies, they also apply to domestic manufacturers right. that can use the duty savings on finished products and then support their uh, domestic manufacturing in the U.S. Right. They support jobs here. Exactly. And, and kind of last, you know, trade promotion authority. I feel like that's an issue that those of us in D.C. talk about a lot um, that doesn't seem that important uh, necessarily because there's no immediate impact on anybody's bottom line. But without trade promotion authority, there's no new trade agreements negotiated. Um, and I, I think that kind of puts the US in, in a more negative position 
Um, I, like my view would be like when we get asked to predict like GSP, MTB, they will happen, you know, and, and I, I'd like to think they'll happen this year. Trade Promotion Authority, I, I'm, I'm not so, so sure how quickly that's going to move. Yeah, I think the last time it was passed, I think, what did it get, Julie? 28 House Democrats, you know, supported it, and that was in a Republican Congress. Right. Um, and I'm going to date myself, my how times have changed. When I staffed Senator Feinstein on Trade Promotion Authority in 2002, I mean, that was, a, I think it was a two-week uh, debate uh, with multiple amendments, multiple votes on those amendments. Oh, to go back to those days where we actually had debate, you know, a thorough <laughs> debate on, on trade and, you know, various amendments. Um, but no, I, I don't think there's that there's the stomach for uh, at this point for a new round of trade promotion authority. It's not popular in uh, the Democratic caucus. And I also, as you know, we mentioned earlier, would like to see movement on a new exclusion process for the, the China 301 tariffs as a part of whatever trade package hopefully emerges by the end of the year. I, I mean, we also haven't heard from the Biden administration or from the U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Tai. They, they haven't been talking about that they even want trade promotion authority. So. Right. Hard to see the Congress taking it on when the administration isn't pushing for it yet. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. And so we wanted to just kind of mention a couple of other um, issues that are that are trade issues, um, maybe not as directly uh, related to to some companies as others. But I'll let Rich, you want to kick off on climate. Yeah, on, on climate, I mean, just for, you know, folks on, on this presentation, something to keep in mind, uh, really at the forefront, you know, as you're looking at outdoor companies and where they make their sourcing options, we've had about 100 outdoor companies come together to form a climate action core to collaborate um, and measure, reduce uh, their carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions, ultimately with the goal of being climate positive by the year, you know, 2030. Um, and so, you know, for our businesses, you know, it's the outdoors has to thrive for our businesses to thrive and climate is an existential threat to outdoor companies. So as outdoor companies are making, you know, sourcing decisions, um, there is going to be an enhanced focus, I think, on uh, reducing the carbon footprint, a focus on sustainable materials, recycled content, organic cotton, bio-based uh, materials. Um, it's something that our members, you know, want to step up to the plate on and do as an industry. Uh, but in a lot of cases, it's what outdoor consumers are also uh, expecting. Um, so is, if you're working with, you know, outdoor companies, it's just something to, you know, to keep in mind. Climate uh, impacts um, so many of their decisions and also clearly will have an impact um, on sourcing decisions as well. No question. And I think for a lot of companies where we continue to look at, you know, what, what are the various options? What are the different groups? What are the different commitments that can be made that, that can be helpful on, on climate? Um, and if we jump to open sh shipping reform, so, you know, why do we include that? Well, there's legislation just introduced uh, in the House that tries to deal with some of the systemic issues that are exacerbating the delays at the ports, uh, the port congestion, and especially the higher fees. Um, so this legislation was introduced. I know OIA and USFIA are, are part of an industry group that is supportive of the legislation, um, predominantly because there is language there that will give additional authority and jurisdiction to the Federal Maritime Commission to deal with issues with carriers, but also to try to deal with the, the issues of uh, demerge um, and detention charges, which continue to be, particularly in the face of the, the delays that we have, a, a, a real um, negative impact on, on companies and really not a lot of um, opportunities uh, to get the carriers to, to change uh, their actions. So I think, uh, is, is that legislation going to move? It has a lot of support from exporters. So it, it's an unusual bill, I think, because it has the import community um, and the export community, because U.S. exporters, especially agricultural product exporters, are, are finding that they're having trouble shipping as well um, because of the delays. So I, I think that this legislation has some opportunities to move. I think it does as well. And it's, yeah, it's another, the, the shipping rates are just another cost on top of, you know, the costs that come from the pandemic, that come from the yeah. tariffs. Um, so we're certainly hopeful that Congress and administration will act and 
as I just mentioned, with climate being at the forefront of our members' minds, you know, members having to take a look at air freight um, in lieu of uh, shipping yeah. is not a choice that you know these companies uh, want to face as they're trying to reduce their their carbon footprint. Exactly, it's just another another cost pressure. Yeah. Although at least then you might have the product. I think there's also well, that. That's, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you don't have the product at the right time in the store, and you know everyone has shifted to shorter timelines, um, that's going to be a, another another crisis ahead. And the last thing, just to mention, because it's hanging out there, are the digital service taxes tax cases, um, where the U.S. has withhold has held back on taking action but still could. And there were, you know, apparel products, textile products that were on some of those retaliation lists, you ranging from France to Turkey to India, um, a number of companies that are involved there. Now, once again, we look to the Biden administration and aren't quite sure, like what direction are they going to go, um, right? Are they going to look for um, more penalties? Um, to try to force our trading partners to take different actions on DSTs, um, or are they going to stay at the negotiating table? Yeah, I mean, I, I think our certainly hope is that they remain true to what we had expected, and this would be, you know, administration to emphasize multilateral dialogue, multilateral negotiation, um, without having to resort to um, punitive penalties, punitive tariffs. Um, but we'll see where we, we end up. I mean, as, as so many other things, it's it's difficult to keep this on you know, our radar screen when we're, our members are dealing with so many other challenges. But um, right, as, as, as products end up on retaliatory lists, that, uh, that always gets our attention. Yep, we'll be watching that closely. And then just to kind of briefly, it's not really a trade issue. They're not, but they are trade issues, right? Um, is you know, what's happening around the world politically that's disrupting some of our key supply chains, um, looking at, both Myanmar, where I think just today, USDR Thai, you know, talked about the, the situation, and was encouraging our, our colleagues in ASEAN to take more action to deal with um, the military coup in Myanmar and how to improve the situation there to move back toward democracy. Um, and similarly, the disruption in Ethiopia with the civil war that is ongoing, um, and of course, threatens for Ethiopia the their AGOA certification for 2022. I think with Myanmar in particular, and that's that's an issue very you know near and dear to, to my heart. Something that I worked on for a number of years. Again, when I, back when I was on the Hill. But as the re political reforms emerged, and we saw what we had hoped would be you know permanent transition to. Uh, democracy, you did see a lot of outdoor companies identify Myanmar as a, as a beneficiary country under GSP with some of the sanctions lifted um, as an alternative sourcing option um, for outdoor products, including uh, travel goods um, that, you know, as, as I mentioned, became part of the, the, the program. And the coup happened, um, and then you, you just saw companies scrambling, um, you know, to get as much product out of Myanmar as possible and identify a new sourcing option. So it was a, an unfortunate reminder you know, I think for a lot of companies is that, you know, political risk calculations always have to be at the yeah. forefront of your sourcing decisions, particularly um, in some of these in countries, um, because what looked like a more, a, a more permanent shift towards a democracy, you know, certainly took um, a wrong turn um, and disrupted uh, a lot of supply chains uh, as, as a result. Yeah. And, and may I add a quick point? Um, and I totally agree with Julie and Rich. So people know, know, you know, COVID last year actually results in a significant drop of U.S. apparel imports, but actually U.S. apparel imports from Myanmar went up last year. It's very interesting. And also Myanmar actually was regarded as one of the most exciting emerging sourcing base for many U.S. fashion brands and retailers. I do remember when we did a benchmarking study, you know, with Julie's organization, U.S. Fashion Industry Association, and often, you know, especially before COVID, and companies say, you know, I want to, you know, very seriously exploring you know, more sourcing from the country. However, if you look at the trade data after the military coup, it's totally, totally different world. So what, it just reminds us you know, how those non-economic factors can affect sourcing and trade. And sourcing is definitely, you know, you know far more than just about, you know, chasing the you know, lowest wage in the world. This, those, those kind of old mentalities actually no longer true. 
So let's kind of move, we're gonna move down to the sourcing issues and Shang, let me turn the floor over to Shang who has some terrific slides that you all are gonna to wanna to ponder after today's session. Shang. Sure, sure, thank you, Julie. Okay, just after, I mean, just listening to you and Rich comment just reminds me how crazy the world is. And just think about how companies have to react and have to survive such a challenging time, both because of this policy issue and also because of COVID. Um, so, um, you know, I'm an economist, so my comments were mostly coming from, you know, how I look at the trade data. And also I would like to share some um, key findings uh, from a recent study I conducted uh, with, with, with Julie's organization, the U.S. Fashion Industry Association. Um, three kind of aspect. One is you know, how to look at the impact of COVID on apparel sourcing and trade. Second, you know, what are some of the latest U.S. Uh, company sourcing strategy? And also, you know, how about the evolving or shifting sourcing base? And next slide, please. Yeah, and this is my favorite chart, actually, <laughs> in a half years. It's not because I made it. But it just reminds me of all these kind of dramas, kind of crazy things happened happened because of COVID. And you definitely can compare the red line with the, you know, the line you know, um, in, in another color. And you know, the red line is just you know, you know, it's the uh, recovery process during COVID. And blue line is about the recovery process during the 2008 financial crisis. They, they, they kind of share nothing. They really kind of share nothing. And it reminds us, really, COVID is very different from a financial crisis. How so? You know, first you can see the red line is much more flunk creating, much more flunk creating, just like you know, at the beginning of the COVID, you know, all of a sudden trade volume cut by more than half. Okay, unprecedented, unprecedented. And then also very interesting, in just one month, we started to see recovery. Mm. Okay, all of COVID, you no, know, record a financial crisis. It took about 13 months to see more kind of you know, obvious train of recovery, but it took just one month you start to see, you know, you started to recover. And the recovery actually was very robust, you know, from May until October last year. Okay. And you know, Julie know that. And you know, I built an economic model, you know, you know, I was very excited, but then the model failed. Why? It's not because I used a wrong method, it's because we have the second and third wave of COVID. Truly mm -hmm. expected. Okay. And now you can see what happened this year. You know, at the beginning, we had a really exciting opening. You know, all of a sudden, trade volume doubled, got really doubled. And then you know, we know we have the Delta variant and trade volume start to drop. So it's much more fluctuating and related to the second point. It's much harder to forecast, much harder to predict. I really have no idea what will happen next. It's not because I'm, I'm an economist, so we're really bad at forecasting, but really, so many uncertainties out there. Um, and next slide, please. And this, I mean, this is also the case if you look at the trade volume. And um, just a reminder, if you check in the monthly trade data, you have to look at those seasonally adjusted data because, you know, apparel imports follow a seasonal pattern. And, you know, in the past, usually, you know, companies will in, you know, import a lot of products from May until October, because this is the period to build up inventory for, this, uh, for the holiday season. However, you can see what was happening in the most recent month actually is dropping, dropping. And my personal interpretation is it is a joint effect of COVID, Delta variant, and also may reflect the shipping crisis. A lot of products we want to you know, import from Asia cannot arrive in the US. Um, but no matter how, and you can see uncertainty. You know, even consumers want to purchase, but we cannot get the products. Yeah, next slide, please. So this is the crazy business environment, right? So how companies are reacting, are reacting to the current business environment. So both from the trade data and from our benchmarking study and talking directly to brands and retailers. Um, two things really stand out. Uh, one is, you know, I think companies mention a lot these days. I want to strengthen the relationship with key vendors, with key vendors. And a second, you know, what kind of countries or what kind of vendors will be most attractive during COVID? And um, that is those that can offer competitive price, but also very important, flexibility and agility. So these are the two things really stand out. Um, next slide, please. So let's just take a look at from where US companies source their products these days. Um, so this graph actually, uh, 
I think um, it's very clear, you know, um, you know, Asia remains the dominant sourcing base. You know, somehow, you no, know, no, no. Each time when I update this, you know, this graph, I feel a little bit kind of disappointed. It's so boring, right? Nothing changed. <laughs> yeah. But actually, there are a lot of changes behind the scene. Behind the scene. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so this is from our benchmarking study. So we directly talked to brands and retailers to see, you know, you know, from where they mostly source their products. And this is highly, highly consistent with the trade data. So Asia, you know, as a whole, remains the most utilized sourcing base. So nine out of the top ten most utilized sourcing base are based in Asia, uh, led by China, Vietnam, you no know, India, you know, Bangladesh, you name it. Yeah. And next slide, please. And I just want to add, Cheng, while as you're transitioning to this, that I think that builds again on what Rich and I were talking about of companies looking at Western Hemisphere, um, but but they're not there yet. They haven't yeah. been, they haven't made that shift yet. Right, right. Yeah. And you know, this is one of our most kind of popular chart in the benchmarking study. So we in you know we asked um, respondents, you know, fashion brands and retailers to provide their you know, um, evaluation um, of the leading sourcing base against um, some of the primary sourcing criteria like you know, sourcing cost, speed to market, flexibility, agility. Um, compliance, risk, environmental, and social and labor. And this time, I'd like to look at from a different perspective rather than just look at each specific sourcing base. But let's just see, you know, we know the top sourcing base is China, um, Vietnam, Bangladesh, what they are mostly good at doing. Let's see what these countries are mostly good at doing. And you can see very clearly, it's cost of goods. So sourcing from these places remain, you know, you know, most price attractive or price competitive and also flexibility and agility. So kind of recall my kind of themes mentioned earlier. So, you know, you know cost of goods is, is quite easy to understand, but what does it mean, you know, flexibility and agility? Next slide, please. This is my favorite chart too, by the way, because um, I love this. And, and what, I, what I continue to hear from folks is that it's that, the intangible of the flexibility and agility that many source that sourcing executives are, are looking for. And not everyone has the same definition, but that's pretty critical, especially when we talk about the policy decisions, right? Um, or the right. geopolitical impacts um, that you need to know you have that option with your suppliers. Right. And maybe all of a sudden your supply chain is disrupted. So yeah. what are you going to do? So this is just one perspective to understand or interpret flexibility and agility. So this is the, actually, this is the market data to see what kind of apparel products are available in the US retail market. And you can see those labeled made in China, they're almost any products in any category. So just reminds us China can make any products in any quantity. So this is why, you know, retailers say, or brands say, you know, China can offer the most you know, flexibility and agility. Um, if you look at the product assortment um, of those sourced from Vietnam, Bangladesh, they're less diversified, but overall it's okay. But if you look at those products, you know, in the U.S. market that are labeled made in Mexico, majority of them are tops, majority of them top, much more narrow, much more kind of, you no. Know, uh, I mean, focus on some specific product categories. And we need more than just tops in our daily life, right? Um, yeah, and next slide, please. And the same issue comes with CAF to DR members or from Haiti, you know, also much more concentrated compared with sourcing from Asia. So this is why, you know, if you put China, Vietnam, and Bangladesh, you can almost source any products, but you cannot simply just remove these sourcing orders, you know, to CAF to DR members to USMC members. And this is probably why, you know, still, you know, despite of all these challenges, China, I mean, Asia remains the dominant sourcing base. Yeah, and can I, can I add a quick point yeah, on please. that? Sure. Yeah, you know, I think it just it reflects, I think, something that I mentioned earlier for outdoor companies that are looking to source innovative, highly technical apparel, protective apparel, you know, to you know protect you from the outdoors when you're out on the ski slopes or hiking or camping. And I think it's probably reflected in you know speed and agility and in cost. But you know, again, outdoor companies are looking for you know vendor and partners that have the know-how and the infrastructure to develop. Uh, these products. And so while they may want to, you know, diversify their sourcing options, perhaps to the Western Hemisphere, 
that it's just it's not it doesn't exist in, in so many of those countries. Um, right. And it takes why, time. And it takes time. Right. Yeah. Right. It takes time to invest to yep. capacity. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Rich. Yeah. And also, now this is quite interesting. Um, so I do remember, you know, we do this benchmarking study since 2014. So before 2019, um, actually, we heard a lot about, okay, companies want to continue to source from more countries, working with more vendors because they you know, want to diversify their sourcing to, to reduce the risk. But this time, this time you can see they're obvious. More companies, more companies plan to, you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily leaving any country, but they definitely want to you know, reduce the number of vendors they work with. The same countries, but reduce the number of vendors they work with. And in contrast, you can see those you know, companies plan to expanding become much fewer, become much fewer. Yeah, and next slide, please. So this is why I you know I mentioned you know, strengthening the relationship with key vendors is a very important kind of trend um, that needs to, you know, uh, I mean, miss our attention. And then all put it, put it in this way, um, well, I think, you know, it's not necessarily new that companies want to achieve flexibility and agility in sourcing, but there are different ways to achieve that goal. So in the past, maybe, you know, you're thinking, okay, let me, you know, you know work with you know, more vendors, source, more, uh, source from more countries, and this can give me more flexibility. I can easily switch my suppliers. But these days, because of the particular situation of COVID, right, you have a lot of restraints, financial restraints, and supply chain disruption. Maybe I can achieve the same goal in different ways. How about let, let me leverage my relationship with key vendors, especially those most capable vendors. Say the vendor, okay, not only have factories in China, but also have factories in Vietnam and Bangladesh. Then if something happens in one country, I can easily, easily, or that vendor can easily help me to find an alternative sourcing base. And vice versa, and maybe I can work with a vendor that has the vertical manufacturing capability, then I don't have to worry too much about fabric sourcing, yarn sourcing. So this is a different way of thinking, you know, how to leverage my relationship with key vendors and using them as a partner to partner to go through this challenging time. So I think this is a very interesting trend to watch. Um, Julia Rich, do you have something to add? No. <laughs> no I think sure. I mean, yeah, yes, of course, but no, <laughs> I'm not interested. Okay. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, so, um, as Julian mentioned, um, truly, you know, um, from data, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm an economist. So I um, really pay a lot of attention to the changes from the data, and I um, really can say, you know, at this point, at this point, from the data, uh, it suggests growing interest in near sourcing, especially from CAF to DR members from Captain Europe members, both in terms of quantity and in terms of value, in terms of value. Okay, and next slide, please. Um, you know, we asked companies, you know, what, you know, what can be done further to encourage you to source more from this region? I think this is a key question and we can think about, and this is their recommendation. And actually, you know, you know personally, and I would read them not just line by line, but really read them as a entire story. So the top concern to me is we have limited supply of textile raw material in this region, especially fabric. So because if you have so limited choices and optum, it means very expensive US made textiles. Then you have to, so you no, know, then you have to deal with the pricing problem. The price is not competitive. You have so many, you know, um, so little choices. So flexibility becomes a problem minimum you know, order quantity. So if we can find a way, say maybe make the you know, loose version less restrictive or maybe make it more supply chain friendly, you know, this is a burst word and you know, in the late part of Obama administration, and maybe things can improve, maybe things can improve. And also, you know, and I would say still there are some pending questions in my mind. And you know, for example, yeah, we do see from the data, you know, US company sourcing more ground Captured to your members, but what, but what kind of products they're increasing, increasing sourcing from the region? Is it there still basic items? So if it's just basic items, this means maybe it's because companies temporarily cannot source the same product from Asia. And if things go back to normal and they may switch back to Asia, or is this is something permanent or something 
you know, some permanent sourcing orders moving from Asia to, you know, to this region. So I think still there are many things we can consider, but no matter how I agree, you know, you know, capital region involves a lot of potential growth or potential sourcing opportunity. Yeah, so that's my comments. So uh, yeah, feel free to add any points, Julian Rich. Why don't I stop sharing and we can also take questions from the audience. If there are questions from the audience. Coming back, can you see me here? Let's see. Okay, Kevin, do we have anything from Facebook? Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions here. That generally means that you guys covered all bases and did a phenomenal job. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then I just want to add on, you know, Shank's last point because I, 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 I kind of go back to this that, you know, a real opportunity area for sourcing and an area where right now we're looking at what are strategies that fit into trade policy that we can go to the administration or to the Congress with on how can we enhance and improve Western Hemisphere sourcing. And like we're focused on CAFTA and then of course to USMCA, but there's also, you know, Colombia, Peru, Chile, we have other free trade agreements where we have, um, I, I call them siloed sourcing, right? Because they're not able to share inputs with each other. Um, but we have a lot of opportunities for Western Hemisphere sourcing uh, that I think companies are looking at and the ability to talk to Rich and to me. And, you know, let, let's let see, uh, are we missing some things that would be meaningful to sourcing executives? Yeah, I, I just, you know, to emphasize the point again for outdoor products, it's about that technical expertise, the know-how, the infrastructure to develop those products. And if we saw that emerge in some of these countries in the Western Hemisphere, you know, I do think you'd see a number of outdoor companies take another look, but so much of their focus and attention is, continues to be, um, on Asia, um, but added to that is an interest in diversifying, you know, the supply chain. So I was really struck by the results of the survey on, you know, fewer, um, you know, partners, because um, mm -hmm. the sense that I get from a lot of outdoor companies is they want to have their eggs in several different baskets rather than just uh, one, but maybe the two are still, um, you know, that, that still works and maybe you spread to more countries, but limit your partners in those countries. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think there's, as, as long as, you know, we're still short of a more stable, predictable trade policy. I mean, these issues are going to be um, faced by a number of different companies. And the Western Hemisphere is, you know, remains an attractive option um, because of the, the distance to the U.S. All right, I'll see. So we have, do have a couple questions that just came in. This is from Marion Jones, Marlon Jones, excuse me, for a luxury fashion startup focused in menswear, what would be the best way to evaluate the abilities of the variety of manufacturing slash sourcing companies overseas? Who wants to tackle Ooh. that? <laughs> I know that's a little bit of a broad question. But <laughs> no easy questions here. I, I mean, because it's so very complicated, and, and I think it's especially complicated if you're if you're talking about luxury menswear, right? Then then you're probably talking about a broad range of product types that are not just the traditional, you know, tops and bottoms that we're showing up in Chang's uh, analysis. Right, but looking for some tailored options and for um, it's more complicated, and so it's not it's not an e it's not an easy answer um, for for how to find the right suppliers there. I mean, you probably have your own matrix though of what of what you're looking for, um, and what I often recommend folks to do if they are new looking at an area is to talk to the local industry apparel association or footwear association or um, leather association if you're looking at leather products um, that usually there's someone to talk to in country or in region who who can give you a start at at who are the suppliers there that are likely to meet your needs and often they will have people who are willing to help you and work with you on your criteria you know for what price points you're looking at or you know what particular skills that that you're looking for so 
maybe Rich and Shang have better answers, but for me, I mean, I think it's not an easy solution. Um, but by the way, if you if you are looking for suggestions of who to talk to, I'm sure we all could make suggestions if you're looking, say, in Guatemala or if you're looking in Vietnam, for who are some of the contacts. Okay, what, was that is that directed towards one uh, Mitch or Shang? Nothing more to add on, on my one. I, 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 yeah, so, <laughs> I think Julie covered it all. You know, well, I uh, probably can only add a quick points about yeah. a trend I see very interesting. You know, from looking at the retail data. Actually, we know we know, you know we know brands and retailers are under rising you know cost pressure, and what products actually enjoy the highest price increase, retail price increase, actually is luxury goods last year, followed by you know, value products, you know, those really price uh, quite competitive. Um, the reason for the increase, the price increase of luxury goods, I think probably is you know, on the one hand, you know, a lot of affluent consumers, you know, because they saved money from travel, you know, from holidays, and they just start to spend more on clothing. So the demand is actually quite high. So the supply actually is quite limited because companies, you know, they don't want to mass manufacturing these products is quite interesting. But also I want to say trade, trade also matters for luxury goods, right? Especially many luxury goods come from Europe. So the US relation with all the Atlantic partnership, right? Think about last year we have the you know, Boeing and Airbus trade disputes, a lot of luxury products are affected actually. And also, you know, there are a lot of anticipation or hope, you know, we can, resume the US-UK free trade agreement negotiation, actually. So trade is still highly, highly relevant you know, to the luxury sector. Mm -hmm. Comments. Right. And we had um, another good uh, resource for you is also going to be, um, if you want to jump into our matchmaking um, um, center here at the trade show, you can ask an ATS staff member um, what would be a good place to find, uh, you know, your sourcing opportunities for a specific product category in luxury men's wear that you're looking for. So that's why we're here as a show. We're bringing people together. We do have an extensive network. And if we don't have the supplier or vendor you're looking for, we can certainly point in the right direction to find that. We're partnered with many uh, trade organizations around the world. So um, I highly encourage everybody to go into the matchmaking booth that's in the virtual show. So on the dashboard there. Um, we've got another few questions coming in here. Comment from Robert Barcello. Hello, Robert. Good to see you. Congrats to all panelists on a great presentation. Most sourcing conversations are always centered around China. Um, they are a partner. They're, they're a large uh, player in the global community. Um, how can we make more focus on conversation on Latin America sourcing port Everglades? It's the USA's number five import port. We'd love to host virtual events towards this end. Robert's actually been with us in our Miami um, virtual show as well. So uh, Robert, we look forward to having you on again to continue to discuss um, the Latin American wing of sourcing, which is increasing as far as, uh, you know, what, what they're doing and on the global stage. So uh, another question just came in. How can we rewatch the webinar afterwards? Everybody that's signed up for the ATS emails and if, uh, if you've registered for the show, you'll be provided with all of that. Generally, we, we post that on our YouTube channel and they'll become um, available within a week or two of the show concluding. Um, let's see here. My question is regarding finding sources for global sourcing. What are some of the best databases to look for suppliers and vendors? Currently, I'm developing a database for sustainable vendors across textile packaging for consumer goods. I would love to look for other organized databases to make it accessible and easy to use for all. Thanks. Does anybody have any resources they'd like to share here as well? I'd like to say before we do that, ATS is also a great resource that we have and we do have access to a lot of databases as well. So again, please, I encourage everybody to go into the uh, matchmaking booth. Somebody from the ATS staff will be there to help you out as well to find those, uh, those databases. But um, Rich, Julia, Cheng, um, if any of you have any resources you'd like to share right now? I think we're always, I think everyone is always looking for more data, uh, databases that have information, especially that relates to sustainability. I think that that is really important. Um, 
it's not exactly our topic today, but I happened to be talking with folks at the Commerce Department last week, and they will be relaunching their um, Made in USA database with updated information soon. Um, and I think sometimes that that's kind of a good jumping off point, right, for who is there that they're not all necessarily having all their inputs from the US. But I think we could we can use more databases. And, just, and more and more trade shows. Yeah, I we, you know, we just had our in person outdoor retailer show uh, in August, and hopefully they will be really back up to speed for our winter show in January, um, because that is just a great networking opportunity, um, you know, for a lot of our, our members and, and companies. Um, and we do have a new director of research at OIA, and I've gotten a lot of ideas for her from this presentation. Today, so <laughs> I'm going to follow up. Can we go visit her? Yeah, <laughs> right. I, and just a great point. Everybody watching, I highly encourage you to attend virtually or otherwise um, as many trade shows as possible. It's, it's the place where everybody comes together to share this information. There's a lot of databases that may not be uh, or resources that may not be easy to find um, through a Google search, but are certainly insider information that you will get from the professionals working in this industry. Two databases, which are actually um, kind of the nexus of how we started ATS, our top 10 holes on manufacturer.com, um, which are the um, show producers of ATS. So again, highly recommend to go in there. If everybody goes into the show dashboard, you just click on um, the show office. Again, that's where you'll be able to ask any questions about um, you know, pointing you in the right direction as far as sourcing goes or any other database you'd like to access. So um, with that said, I think this is a good jumping off point. I'd like to thank our panelists. It's good to see each one of you again. Look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person. I know we keep saying that every, every virtual. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully before a lot will actually come to fruition. Yes. So, um, and then we will be uh, on, on the topic of sustainability that Julie had just mentioned. Uh, we do have our next uh, seminar coming up here is another great panel sustainability from the designer's perspective coming up at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or nine o'clock if you are on the West Coast. So um, again, thank you everybody. Good to see you again. And uh, everybody here will be in the going in and out of the show office room. So please, if you won't have any other questions for them, please go into there and take it take a look. Bye everybody. Take care. Take Thanks. care. Good to see you. Bye. 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 Bye.